Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Martin Garrett. I'm the Chief Exec at uh, Cambridge Cleantech. So delighted just to say um, a few words of welcome um, this afternoon. I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping first of all, and a couple of pointers as to what's happening at Cambridge Cleantech. And I'm going to hand over to uh, our co-host today, uh, Peter Bates, who's going to say a few words um, as well. Um, so just in terms of um, housekeeping, um, please remain muted uh, during the course of the presentation. Uh, if you have a pressing question, please use the chat box, which is in the uh, centre bottom of your um, Zoom console. And a piece will either raise the question as the speaker finishes or we'll leave it to the, uh, the Q&A in the chat rooms um, at the end. Um, the event is being recorded, uh, just for your information. And of course, we have um, Orianne, who you've already met, and Cynthia in the room as well, just to keep an eye on things in case we have um, any problems. So I think that's it for um, the background. Just in terms of what we're doing at Cambridge Cleantech at the moment, uh, we have our um, Cleantech newsletter, a monthly newsletter coming out next week. So watch out for that. Lots of opportunities um, in that. Uh, we're also promoting our next event, which is going to be a finance special interest group event on the 29th of June. Uh, so just at the, uh, the end of next month. Um, we've had quite a, a few new members from within the financial services community join us recently. So a company called Granted, uh, which as its name sort of implies, supports SMEs with bid writing to secure public sector grants. So join as an associate founder member. The Clean Growth Fund, which was initially or partly funded by uh, the UK government to set up a new fund for clean growth in the UK, have joined also um, as associate founder members and also Shire Leasing, who do uh, leasing operations for clean tech businesses as a way of selling your products uh, often to, to customers and uh, clients. So you will be hearing from those either at the next event or in future uh, finance events, but as access to finance is the number one priority of members, I thought it was just important just to update you on those uh, pieces of information. But enough of that and enough on Cambridge Clean Tech. We've got this uh, terrific lineup uh, for you this afternoon. So I'm going to hand straight over to Peter Bates, who's just going to say a few more words of introduction about the event itself. Peter, over to you. I think you're on mute, Peter. Peter, you're on mute. Okay, sorry, my, my apologies. I'm trying to control two things and making a mistake of it. So um, welcome everybody. And thank you very much, uh, Martin, for the introduction. And uh, the, welcome to the sixth um, session of the Sustainable Smart Homes uh, event. Uh, if I start off and just uh, very briefly explain about the uh, Sustainable Smart Homes Special Interest Group, as I tend to uh, do. Uh, the focus is on sustainability, the focus is on looking at using smart uh, technology, and the focus is on looking at homes, uh, particularly dom you know, domestic properties rather than commercial properties in that respect. And in the UK, there's something like 27 million homes that do need to be addressed uh, in terms of deep retrofitting and installation of renewable energy services uh, in order to um, meet the uh, UK government's uh, net zero carbon targets by 2050, uh, or even earlier in, in some areas now. Um, can I just also uh, point out that we also have a LinkedIn group, and if you just go and do a search within LinkedIn on sustainable smart homes, uh, it will take you to this link here as well. But um, today we're going to uh, focus on looking at uh, changes that are taking place as far as energy production and distribution is concerned and what impact that could have uh, in your own home, particularly as people increasingly move towards uh, buying electric vehicles. So this diagram um, actually shows you what has been happening uh, as far as electricity production is being concerned. Um, it used to be dominated by large power plants. We're now moving. Uh, it's probably no longer the tomorrow. We've already got large numbers of people have got solar PV panels on their own um, homes. Uh, we've also I can't got... see any pictures, Peter. 
Okay, I think we've got a bit of an issue here then. Let me just see what we've got. I can. Sorry, sorry, who can see me and who can't? You can see the electricity production and distribution page. Yeah, I can see that. I think just have to remember there's two two screens. Uh, one will be the video and the other is the uh, presentation. Um, sorry, can I, are you seeing the one entitled electricity production and distribution? Yep. Yes, we yeah, are. So it's, so. it's okay now. That's fine. Go for it. Okay, that's that's great. That, that's the one which I, I'm showing, yes. Okay, so uh, production is changing uh, quite rapidly um, as we're using more and more renewable resources. We're moving away from a centralised market where these large power plants and distributors uh, would send us the electricity to a much more distributed environment. We're also, transmission is moving from being the large based uh, power lines uh, to again a much more distributed, smaller scale uh, transmission and, and regional supply um, networks there. We're moving away from top to bottom to a much more kind of distributed um, approach, which is actually going both ways. And we're also, as far as the consumer is concerned, the consumer is moving away from just being a, a passive um, user who actually then pays for the electricity to becoming more of a uh, somebody who is also buying and selling electricity back to the grid when it's appropriate. And there's lots of things occurring in, in the uh, market at this moment in time. But we're going, today we're going to focus on one thing, and hopefully now you've got the next slide, which is the vehicle to grid slide, uh, which I've got here. We're going to focus today on vehicle to grid because um, increasingly people are getting electric vehicles uh, and increasingly uh, they are putting them on their drives or in their garages if they have them. And that creates new opportunities for for them in order to buy and sell electricity so here we are my own driveway currently i've only got the ability with my electric vehicle to be able to get electricity from the grid uh, using that um, in effect a uni charger but increasingly it is becoming possible uh, and uh, you'll see examples of this later on during the presentations because we have two pilot projects who, who will be talking about their experiences of using uh, two-way vehicle to grid. Um, that also has an impact uh, uh, on national grid themselves uh, um, and also has an impact on the uh, network distribution uh, organizations who actually distribute that electricity to the home. Now, I, I, I want to emphasize something which I, 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 I'm quite passionate about. I'm not advocating that every person gets an electric vehicle uh, and just replaces it by uh, fr from their internal combustion engine to an electric vehicle. I believe the electric vehicle has a place in reducing carbon emissions uh, but as part of, of a mixture of modes of transport. So you know, those modes of transport could be uh, via electric vehicles, could be by public transport, um, could, could be by um, community share of electric vehicles uh, in that respect. So I think that's important that you know, the, the future scenarios may be that we won't actually have so many vehicles on the road, we hope, because that would create another problem. But there are new opportunities for those that do need to have a vehicle uh, to be able to um, take advantage of this change in the landscape concerning um, the way electricity is produced and distributed. So I'm going to move on to uh, Craig, who is going to introduce himself as all the other speakers will be doing later today. And he's going to explain what the commercial viability of residential vehicle to grid charges are. OK, Greg. Thank you very much, Peter. Sharing mine. OK, I shall just see if I can get the uh, 
slide shared with you all. So do say if you can't see anything. I'm assuming you can here. Yeah, we can. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so my name is Greg Payne. I'm the modeling and simulation lead here at Senex. So just a, a little bit, first of all, about Senex, if for those of you who haven't heard of us. So we're an independent, not-for-profit organization. Um, and we, we support um, a lot of companies and local authorities in making the transition to low emission transport. So we do a lot of work in, in the R&D sector. So looking at some of the cutting edge and state-of-the-art technology there. So V2G is one of the things we spend an awful lot of time looking at and, and trying to understand and trying to develop. Um, but we also do a fair amount of consultancy work as well, helping out local authorities or or businesses in how to understand what their requirements are and what they need to do in order to transition to low emission vehicles and how they understand what infrastructure they might need to do in order to do that. But today we're here to talk about V2G. So it's come a long way in six years since we, we first sort of saw it in the UK. Um, and that's, uh, you can see the picture there, nice Polaroid snap of um, the first uh, V2G unit installed in the UK. That was at Aston University. Um, and it's not exactly a small device there, about the size of two filing cabinets, weighs a ton, has to be on a large concrete plinth. Um, and it had quite a few undesirable features in terms of how it worked. Um, but things have moved on a lot. So on the right here, we're seeing uh, an actual V2G charger that was installed as part of the Sirius trial. Um, so that was done, um, that one was installed, I think, probably in 2020. Um, and so you can see it's a much smaller unit. It's wall mounted um, and, so it's, and it's also much more user friendly, much more effective. Now, the cost has also reduced the V2G units over the last few years. Six years ago or so, you were looking about upwards of £15,000 for a V2G unit. Um, now, those have, costs have fallen. Back in 2019, uh, the vehicle to grid charger premium, so this is the, the additional cost of a, of a V2G unit on top of, um, I suppose, a, a, a standard smart charger um, installed at, at someone's home. So those, that additional premium was forecast as part of the vehicle to grid Britain project that, that we were involved in. Um, and you can see that cost down projection there. Um, as to what, what we thought at the time, the, the, how the prices or the costs would fall. Good news is that so far we've actually exceeded that cost reduction forecast. So in Project Sirius, which is one of the projects that, that Tom Packham will be speaking about in, in more depth later on, we've actually seen the, that incremental cost or that charger premium fall down to about £3,700. So that's, that's below that, that cost curve. So in terms of this, this capital cost, we are getting the, the prices down, which is great news for the, for the industry and for V2G. But what about the revenue side? So that's really the other half of the deal when it comes to thinking about the economics of V2G for, for the residential case here. Um, well, back in 2019, um, we looked at some of this through, this through understanding the true value of V2G report, which is a publicly available report, which you can pick up online for free. Um, back at that time, we didn't have much data on VG users, users rather. Um, so we ran simulations based on the available data we had. And we used back then, we used the Economy 7 tariff, so not a very smart tariff. And we, we calculated what, it, what the sort of the value, annual value per charge point. So this is about a seven kilowatt charge point. Um, what that would be, we looked at two cases. One was a sort of a high plug in rate and low mileage case. And the other was a low plug-in rate and high mileage case. And you can see the value there. So the absolute value of sort of the optimized V2G, so that's using V2G against this economy seven tariff, you, you're getting sort of around about hundred pounds a year. So it's not great. If you add in uh, grid services, so in this case, we're looking at uh, FFR, so the FFR service, then you can, you can get that up to 512 pounds a year, which is substantially better. So how has this revenue side evolved in the last few years? Well, now we've got data on over 300 
V2G units in the field. So we've, through the series projects again, so we've had loads of data, loads of great real world data of people actually using their units um, and the real driving patterns of, of when people are plugging in, when they're unplugging, how much driving they're actually doing. Um, and we've done some more revenue simulations on this real world data. This time, what we did was we used a better tariff. So we actually used a tariff that was based around the wholesale spot electricity price. So it had much more shape to it and much more flexibility. And that gives V2G a much better chance to, to optimize against it. What we see there, though, um, is that we get higher revenues from V2G. Um, so for the optimized V2G, we're looking for about, about £340 per unit per year. That's optimizing against the tariff. Then if you add FFR, the Firm, firm Frequency Response Service, um, which is a service provided to National Grid, or the emerging new service DC in there, which is dynamic containment, you can get up to £725 a year. Um, now, there are some barriers with providing DC, but it shows the, the art of what's possible there. The other thing we looked at as part of the, um, the series trial um, is understanding the different archetypes, the residential archetypes of V2G. So we've done some work on, on creating these different archetypes of, of different potential customers who would be suitable for V2G. And what we did is, is in the project, we looked at all of the different, um, different participants. We got them to ask, answer a survey. And through the survey, we were able to sort of classify them as these different archetypes. And then we could see which ones were doing the best from V2G. And the answer is that they do vary somewhat. Um, and they vary primarily among by the availability of their car for being plugged in and being available for V2G services. So there's a correlation between the value that they can get from V2G and how much of the time they're actually plugged in and, and ready to be available to, to be utilized. What we found was the, the archetype called the retired professional was the one that was probably best because that, that was what the one which had one of the highest availability rates. So one where the car was plugged in an awful lot of the time um, and, and left to, to be able to optimize stuff on the grid. So summarizing some of the things that we've found over the last few years from, from the work we've done in, in V2G for this, for this residential um, business case. First of all, the, back at the beginning, we made this prediction and thought, well, EV drivers, we think will plug in more of the time than typical, sorry, V2G, EV drivers were plugging more of the time than typical EV owners. What we found is that actually does hold true. So from the data we've had come in, um, the plug-in rates were around about 68% of the time. That was at the beginning of 2020 before lockdown hit. So in the first few months of 2020, we saw that 68% of the time, the vehicle was at home and plugged in. Now, once lockdown in, in 2020 hit, of course, that went up even higher. But that's a significant increase in what we see with um, normal EV drivers who don't have V2G, where they're plugging in about 30 to 40% of the time. Another thing we found is that more granular tariffs can, uh, with greater volatility, help the V2G business case. So when we looked at the Economy 7 tariff, which is essentially a two-rate tariff, not much volatility, you know, you get about £100 a year. But when you have a, a tariff which is smarter and varies for every half hour and is, is shaped around the, the spot price, so the, the sort of short-term electricity wholesale prices, what you find there is that you get much better value from B2G. So that's where we got a few hundred pounds worth of, of value over the year straight from that. Um, and we also saw that not all residential customers are equal. And the right, having the right archetype does improve the business case. Well, so what is the business case then? So this is um, a high level summary of the payback period we've, we've got for different scenarios here. Um, and in that first column, you're looking at the current V2G hardware cost. So that's this £3,700 additional cost on top of having a smart charger. And what you see is if you just look at V2G optimized against a tariff, then it's more than a 30 year payback period. So it's not really going to be economic in most cases there. 
Um, what you have to do to make that more attractive is you have to start offering grid services or some other revenue stream. So in this table, we've got FFR and DC as two potential grid services. And the best case you can get down to there is, is about eight years payback time in terms of recovering the cost of that, of, of that hardware cost at the beginning. But we think, you know, we, and we've got a very strong reason to believe that the hardware cost of EGG is going to fall further. It's already come down considerably. If we can get that down to about a thousand pound level, then with just a straight tariff optimization, you find it's only 11 years payback. And if you start offering grid services, you can get it below five years, maybe as low as two years. And, and the final column in here um, is, is a more optimistic case. Now there's, there's a change coming in with how um, some of the um, uh, transmission network use of system charges are being levied on customers' bills. And that's coming in in a couple of years time. And actually that has a negative effect, effect on, the, on the business case for V2G. And that's it, that's already incorporated into those middle columns. If we took that effect out, then, then you end up with a more positive situation and you can pay back V2G in, in under five years in all three cases. Um, now that, that change will come in. However, I've listed that third column in there really to, to demonstrate, because there's a few actually upsides um, which are quite difficult to model at the moment, but we have reason to believe they'll be positive. And, and these include potentially having greater volatil volatility in electricity prices. So that's actually good for the VTG business case because it means there's more they can do to help balance those prices and more they can do in terms of arbitrage to reduce costs. Um, there's also changes coming in which will allow them to offer further services. Um, so th those changes may, may help us with the VTG business case. So we might find ourselves in that third column where we get quite favorable payback times. So a little bit more about those future prospects. So I've mentioned the targeted charging review. So this change to um, transmission network use of system charges. Um, so that could that would have a negative effect by reducing income, excluding group services, to by about 50%. However, there are other changes such as this balancing settlement code modification, number P375, for anyone who wants a geek moment on that code. Um, yeah, that's that's gonna um, help B2G to access balancing mechanism revenue. And that's due to be implemented, I think, June in 2022. So that actually is quite positive. Um, and that will give an additional revenue stream. So while on the one hand, it's being taken away, on the other hand, it's being given. Um, and I mentioned increasing energy price volatility already. If you're interested in further information in this area, I know I've covered quite a lot of, lot of things, a lot of detail there fairly swiftly. Um, if you head to the Senex website um, and search for V2G in the resources section there, you can pick up some of the reports that we've written all for free. So they're all listed there. Um, so feel free to, to pick up some of those. The Sirius Trial Insights report, that's not come out quite yet. That will be in about the next week or so. So look out for that. Um, but those go into a lot more detail on how we've done the analysis and, and uh, what the business case for residential V2G looks like. So that's all for me. Thank you very much for, for listening. Um, I will now hand over to Evie Trollo from UKPN. Thanks, Thanks Greg. If I can just jump in for a moment, uh, just to remind people, if you have any questions, do put them in the chat facility and uh, but put the word question in at, to start off with and then I can check through the chat facility. And then when we have a panel kind of session after the five speakers, I'll try and answer, get as many questions answered as possible in that respect. And if you have not already um, signed up to go to a breakout room, um, please uh, send a direct message to um, Oriane, who will be able to kind of put you into the right group. She'll probably put on the chat what are the three groups uh, which are available. Sorry, Evie, if you'd like to carry on, thanks. No, no worries. Just to check my slides showing okay for everyone. They are, Good. yes. Brilliant, yes. okay. Awesome. Um, right, so I'm Evie Trollov. Uh, I'm an innovation project lead at UK Power Networks, and we're involved in a number of the uh, vehicle to grid trials that are being run in the UK at the moment. So what I'm here to sort of share is our perspective on 
the challenges and opportunities for vehicle to grid and kind of build on some of the emerging service opportunities that um, Greg mentioned. So um, just before we dive into our experience on that, just to cover who UK Power Networks are. So we're a distribution network operator um, and we're the distribution network operator in the south and south southeast of England. So we serve 8.3 million connected customers and that's about 18 million customers or people in total in our area. So it's this area that's shown on the map here. Um, we're, as a distribution network, we are basically, if you, an analogy that's commonly used is the national grid is more like your motorways um, and then distribution networks are more like your, your trunk roads, your, your A and B roads. Um, so we're generally taking or traditionally we were taking power from uh, the transmission network down towards customers homes and businesses um, but like Peter explained that's sort of changing now the way that we operate is becoming much more distributed so we're having more people generating on the distribution network and then providing that to customers within our own network so um, that's a bit of context for who we are and what we do um, our interest in electric vehicles has been going on for over 10 years now um, as transport is electrified, we need to understand where and when that electrification is going to happen so that we can make sure that the electricity network at a distribution level that supplies people's homes and businesses where people will charge is sufficiently rated and ready to um, serve that new need um, from electricity. So to do that, we have developed a strategy for this. Uh, it's made of sort of four key components to prepare our network. And that is forecasting, monitoring, deploying smart and then investing strategically. So the gift that you can see on the left hand side is all about our forecasting data. So we take the national grids future energy scenarios and we use that to inform our own distribution future energy scenarios which are at a much more granular level and that's really us trying to understand that, that question about where and when is the uptake going to occur so that we can prepare in the areas where we need to first and make sure that we do that in the most efficient way possible. Um, once we've done forecasting, which is, um, as you can see on the left, the data is all available. Um, the next key thing for us is to monitor the network. So traditionally, because the network um, was very one directional, things sort of would generate it and then connect to the transmission um, network and then move down from transmission to distribution and then into people's homes. Monitoring what was happening at a local level was not so important, but as we move towards this more interconnected world, having visibility of what's happening on a local level becomes really, really important so that we can make the best use of the network that we already have. So that's another really key part, monitoring the network to validate what's actually happening um, and then improve our forecasts. When we install monitoring, um, I guess one of the key things for us to understand is at what point do we think that there may be a need to increase the network capacity or at what point will there be a constraint? And once we identify that there is a potentially need for um, some sort of intervention, there's the traditional approach, which would have been to build more network. And then there's what we call deploy smart. So this is basically a new toolkit of smart solutions. So looking at commercial and technical ways that we can manage the network capacity that we have in a much more efficient way. So that's really what I'm gonna focus in on today is looking at vehicle to grid as one of those commercial solutions. There's also a number of other different sort of solutions that we have in our toolbox to try and manage that um, capacity more efficiently. Um, so if you're interested in any, any of the others shown on the, this slide, then feel free to check out our website um, or get in touch with me. So when we look at vehicle to grid as uh, a means for providing network services, there's a few things to consider. So this kind of shows you uh, a typical arrangement where you've got the customer, the connection point, and then um, behind the meter on, on this side, and then the network on this side. So vehicle to grid can be used to uh, put energy from your car back into your home or your business, which has benefits to customers but it can also be used to export back onto the network. So you're essentially acting as a generator and providing electricity to other customers. And that's where we're really interested in, in the technology. So looking at um, the energy coming back through this metering point and back onto the network. Uh, if you're interested in some of the other sort of service opportunities, then you can check out this website called the Vehicle to Grid Hub. 
it's a really, really useful sort of one-stop shop for understanding what vehicle to grid is. It explains some of these service opportunities and it also has like a database of all the different trials that are going on, not just in the UK, but around the world. Um, so you can find out a little bit more about them. So like I said, we're involved in a number of different trials looking at vehicle to grid and the kind of interaction that we are looking to understand is not necessarily with the end customer, but with suppliers and service providers. So we've partnered with uh, Octopus. Um, we've also partnered with a number of other um, suppliers and also academia uh, vehicle manufacturers on commercial product, uh, commercial trials. But for the purpose of this slide, I'll just take you through the, the trial that we're doing with Octopus. So in terms of the interaction, like I said, there's the, the distribution network operator, which is UK Power Networks. And then there's the supplier in this instance, which is Octopus Energy. So we're looking at this relationship between the distribution network operator and the service provider. What, what we're looking at in the trial is understanding how we can use that relationship and in what ways we can create market mechanisms that will incentivize the service provider to get their customers to put electricity back onto the network. And the reason we're looking at this is to try and avoid network constraints. So for example, if you've got load on the network, um, our equipment, so the, the network itself and also things like transformers, they are rated to a certain level. And with electric vehicle uptake and the adoption of other technologies like electrification of heat, there's potential for those network thresholds to be uh, exceeded. So we're looking to try and address this part right here. The way that you can do that is through a number of different mechanisms. There's price signals, um, which is shown on the right. So look, we can influence the cost of electricity at certain times through distribution network use of system charges, or there's emerging distribution system operator markets, which are ways where we pay for flexibility and contract with a company to, to provide that. Um, so in this instance, we're, we're looking at a distribution use of system charge, but also an export fee. So the component of cost that we control as uh, UK Power Networks is this orange part. We're also looking to mirror that with an export fee. So as well as charging customers more for electricity during that period, which is 6 to 9 p.m., we're also looking to pay people to generate or put uh, electricity back onto the network during those periods to avoid these constraints. The other half of the equation is then how the service provider or the supplier then interacts and passes that signal on to their customers. And that's what we call the customer proposition. And there's loads of different ways that that can be done. Um, in our partnership working with uh, Albina, I'm sure she'll talk more about this customer proposition soon, but one example is PowerLoop. Um, but there's a, a number of different ways that could be done by different suppliers or service providers, depending on um, who you're engaging with. So that's a little bit about the opportunity side of vehicle to grid. Um, in terms of the challenges side, one of the challenges that, again, Albina and um, I have been working on really closely with is the connections process. So because uh, vehicle to grid can act as a generator on the network, it has to comply with various standards, um, including G99. The process for G99 is typically based around solar and storage. Um, but vehicle grid is a new technology now has to comply with that process and previously the forms and um, the process for that were quite complex and also it was quite slow so we've been doing a lot of work to automate that process and also look at how we can speed it up through a piece of work called smart connect so this is a really exciting piece of work that has developed an approach that will automate that process it, it's an instant assessment um, and it's actually live now, the, the portal. The automated process for vehicle to grid will be going live um, in June. So what Smart Connect does is, as per usual, the customer um, or installer needs to fill in and provide certain information. But instead of doing that through a paper form, they can then do that on a online portal. Once the customer is submitted, we'll run these automated assessments and these happen instantly. If it passes, instant approval is issued to the customer or the installer. And if it fails at that step, it will then automatically be referred to our connections teams. They will then run manual assessments and then if they need to, they will carry out remedial works. 
Once that's all completed, it goes back into the system and, and issues the approval. The other key point for vehicle to grid is at the end of the process, once you have installed the units, you have to provide commissioning documentation. So again, that can all be handled via the portal, um, which provides a streamlined approach and all your information's in the same place. Um, by automating this process, we've also enabled fuse upgrades to be triggered at the same time as you submit your uh, application for a G99. So I think this is one of the key developments, particularly for vehicle to grid. Um, because the, the old process for domestic was uh, about 45 working days, which um, as Albina I'm sure will, will, will note can be a barrier and some customers don't want to wait that long. So we're really excited about making this both much more straightforward for the person who's applying, but also much quicker for customers so that they can get a grid connection faster. So that's just a little bit about the, the two aspects we've been working on, the services and the connections. Um, so I'll leave it there, but if you've got any more questions, um, lo love to hear from you. There's also lots of links to inf more information, which I'm sure will go out with the slide pack. Cool. Um, thank you guys. And I'll ha now hand over to Tom Packenham from OVO. I think it's Adam uh, first. Oh, sorry, Adam. <laughs> Adam for which there will be a recording and mm -hmm. hopefully this will work okay. Yeah. Thanks, Eve. So I'll be sharing the slides. Um, can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah. Um, you might want to put it a bit louder because it's not too loud. You should all be able to hear, but yeah, if you can put it a bit louder on your side, it might help. Um, yeah, right, I'll stop playing now. Good afternoon. My name's Adam Sims. I'm the Power Responsive Manager at National Grid Electricity System Operator. I'm here today to talk to you a bit about the Power Responsive campaign what it's doing and how it facilitates demand side flexibility in Great Britain. So what is power responsive? Well, fundamentally, it is an industry led initiative that was started about five years ago uh, by National Grid and the demand side community. The aim of the campaign is to raise awareness of uh, opportunities for demand side flexibility in the ESO markets to identify barriers to participation and to ensure that demand side flexibility providers views are heard in the electricity system operator. So listed here are a number of our priorities for the year. We're looking at helping inform the development of inclusive markets for flexibility. We're looking at promoting the participation of demand side flexibility, particularly with a focus on ESO markets, although more and more we're looking at supporting uh, demand side um, to access DNO markets as well, so that's distribution network operator markets. We want to make sure that the perspective of customers is heard and that they have forums to feedback their views into the reform work that the ESO is doing. And we also want to ensure that we support progression of Bayes and Ofgem smart systems and flexibility plan. Ultimately, what we're looking at is supporting the delivery of the ESO's ambitions to deliver a sustainable whole energy future and to be able to operate the system zero carbon 2025. And really we see demand side flexibility and demand side providers in general as being absolutely fundamental to enable us to do this. So how does Power Responsive actually aim to achieve some of these goals? Well, we do a lot of work with our partner organisations, such as the uh, Major Energy Users Council, uh, providing case studies and educational materials. Uh, we produce an annual report once a year, which looks back at the ESO markets um, with a particular emphasis on how well demand side flexibility participated or didn't in those markets. We also run our own events, such as the Flexibility Forum, and in the summer, we have the uh, Power Responsive Summer event, which gives the opportunity for uh, interested parties from across the demand side community to get together, um, share knowledge, make contacts, find out more information about developments, and generally celebrate the achievements of demand side flexibility over the past 12 months. We're also attending other um, parties' events. So we go to um, things like the Energy Managers Exhibition, EMEX, we attend uh, MEUC events, we attend Energy UK events, 
It's all to support and raise awareness of the opportunities for demand side flexibility uh, in the ESO markets. So what is the ESO doing to change its markets and make them more easily accessible for demand side flexibility? Well, there are a number of reform programmes ongoing that are looking at specific services such as frequency response or reserve or the balancing mechanism. But overall, the aim of all of these programmes is to make our balancing markets more competitive and making them more simple more fair, more transparent. We want to make sure that the products that we're offering and that we want to, people to provide to us are simple, straightforward, easy to access and easy to dispatch with the control room systems. We want to make sure that those markets are fair and that there are no unnecessary barriers to entry that are based on historical technology types. We want to make sure that there are no special deals sitting alongside established markets and we want to make sure that in the control room, from the control room's perspective, they see no difference between demand side flexibility and large thermal plant. And then underpinning these fair markets and these simple products, we need transparency. We need to be able to clearly articulate to the market what the volume of services we require, when we require it, how much we're willing to pay, and then what the results of those markets are, so that people can look and see the revenue opportunities clearly and easily. So what opportunities are there for demand side flexibility at the moment? Well, wider BM access was delivered recently. The BM or balancing mechanism is the main route through which the control room manages the system. Through it, the control room can either increase or decrease generation or consumption from assets in a continuous market. Historically, the BM has only really been used by large thermal plant connected to the transmission system. But through the wider BM access work, we have improved and created new ways for demand side flexibility to access the BM and offer their flexibility either directly or in aggregate. The distributed restoration project is looking at how you can move from a top down system restoration approach in the event of a black star situation and move to a bottom up approach where large volumes of aggregated distributed assets can be used to restart the system in the event of a blackout. On balancing services reform, there's a lot going on to change individual services and make them fit for purpose and easier to access for demand side flexibility. In this area, we're looking at new frequency response products. We're looking at new reserve products. We're looking at how we can access reactive power from assets connected to the distribution system and others. And then finally, on local flexibility markets, we're working with a number of third party companies to look at how we can better facilitate local markets and access flexibility from pools of providers in, in defined regional locations to meet defined regional uh, system needs. And the work we're doing continues into 2021. Um, there's some big things to look for, particularly reserve markets moving to day ahead procurement from the traditional three or four times a year. This will allow demand side flexibility assets or renewable assets where they may not be able to forecast their availability very far in advance to be able to access these markets and provide services to this grid operator. We're looking at rolling out new frequency response products um, further to our dynamic containment launch back in the autumn. We're also looking, at, looking forward to Ofgem's decision on the access and forward looking charges review which we hope will improve the situation for demand side flexibility providers. There will be lo new local flexibility markets for constraints in Scotland, where we're looking to work with third party platform developers to access constraint services from a defined geographical location. And then Bayes and Ofgem are also support releasing an update to the smart systems and flexibility plan with new targets and new measures which we hope will also improve the situation for demand side flexibility providers. So I hope that's given you a useful if brief overview of Power Responsive and some of the work the ESO is doing uh, to improve the situation for demand side flexibility providers. Overall, we think that demand side flexibility is critical to being able to meet our zero carbon ambitions. And if you want to find out more, please have a look at the Power Responsive annual report or join our mailing list uh, and look out for the summer event in July, which will be virtual this year, but it's normally a physical event. 
If you want to talk directly to some of our uh, market services teams around balancing services opportunities, please drop them an email at commercial.operation at nationalgrideso.com. And for all other information, please check out our website, powerresponsive.com. Okay. Okay, unfortunately, we're not get, nobody's going to be able to um, ask, answer any questions um, from Adam, but if you've got anything specific, do, do go make contact through uh, what he's actually put on the, uh, on the presentation. Let's say he'll be taking questions. If you have any particular question to him, please let us know. And he's happy to take um, the questions in, but after, obviously, he's not in today. Uh, but he'll have a look at it after. Tom, over to you. Hi, everybody. Uh, Tom Packenham here from Ovo Energy. Uh, lovely to be invited here. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a great uh, lead in, actually, uh, the, the presentation before. I think it was an, an interesting point about um, bilateral contracts. I don't know how many of you on this call know that last year, in sort of peak COVID in the summer, energy consumers had to pay an additional un unexpected £140 million pounds uh, approximately over the course of a few months for unexpected balancing costs to the system um, due to the significant drop in demand from business customers. And interestingly, back to the previous presentation, a huge amount of that money went to one generator alone who had a on the side outside of the market bilateral contract with National Grid to provide downturn services on one of their generation assets. And what, what we're really talking about in all of this and is a future where that kind of thing is not necessary, where that kind of cost level is not necessary and where instead of that money going to a single large entity with a single large generating capability, it goes to customers around the country who are using assets that they own, whether it's an electric vehicle or a heat pump or whatever, to provide services into a smart grid. And so it's, it's very helpful, so it's a good context for what we're all about as, as, a, as, an, as an organization over and also what the broader industry is all about and where vehicle to grid can be so valuable. So that's a little bit of context. I mean, it was very helpful. Peter gave some useful context around the way the grid is developing. Um, I think it's worth just re-emphasizing that we are talking about a 180 degree transformation in the way that we run our energy system from one which is uh, where that we turn demand up or uh, supply up or down we turn supply power stations, we literally turn dials and power stations up or down to generate more or less electricity. That's how we've been running the system for, you know, 100 years or more. And in future, we are going to have, because we are going to be running a decarbonized system, which has, we have no control over the supply or much less control over the supply, can't stop the wind or start the wind, um, we have to change demand. And that is a 180 degree transformation where you run our energy system. And it's extremely exciting, but it does mean we have a lot, lot of work to do. Just to build on that context a little bit before I go into Project Skira, so I'll try and be quick because I know we're a bit behind. There is, this is, as, as Peter said, this is, am I in the right, how do I mute this board? We are not, we are not, this is not tomorrow, this is today. We are already in this, in this future, which we're talking about. Penetration of renewables is very high on the grid. Events like I've just described are happening already. And here's a nice little illustration of that in the wholesale market pricing that we're seeing. So you can see here, essentially, this is a comparison um, of some key, key metrics of the system between 2014 and 2020, 2019, 2020. For a start, you can see that the capacity, we tried to find a couple of months which are pretty comparable. So in this case, April 2014 versus April 2020. You can see here that the installed capacity of renewables on the UK grid had almost doubled in that time. See, the weather characteristics of that month were more or less the same. If we move over to the right and look at the wholesale pricing, you can see here that Back in 2014, we had a little bit of upward spiking pricing every so often during that month. What we did not have anything of, I mean, you can see already in 2020, a lot more volatility. And what we didn't have anything of on the, on, uh, below the line is negative pricing. Again, if you look in 2020, you see this incredible change, this difference here in the profile of negative pricing. And again, this is all driven by the growth in renewables. Uh, Albana's company, Octopus, has a really interesting product. I shouldn't, you know, name check my our competitors' products, but it's very interesting and tracks the wholesale price. I'm sure many of you are aware of it, given that you're interested in clean technology. So looking at that here, there's another illustration of that. Sorry, I'm not 
here we go. So here you can see across a three dimensional act, multiple axes, you, again, you can see over the course of the year, how back in 2014, we hardly had any negative pricing and then way more negative pricing event, of events. And similarly in a heat map term, you can see much more volatility above, above, and, uh, above the line as well in wholesale prices. So that goes to show you what's going on in the market and why there will be a market for, for services that can help to stabilize this, this kind of um, phenomenon. There's also a peak, a peak system challenge. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but it's worth just kind of throwing out a kind of response to this. If you have uh, 2 million vehicle to grid chargers plugged in at six kilowatts per charger, that gives you a 12 uh, gigawatt swing in terms of peak uh, power supply um, or power supply rather anytime in either direction. So in other words, actually a 24 gigawatt swing, um, which can be very, very valuable and can show just what you can do with electric vehicles. That's quite aside from the energy storage capabilities of an electric vehicle. So the system is changing. It's already changed a significant amount. It will continue to change. And this kind of demand responsive technology is, is perfect to address that. And electric vehicles are particularly sound for addressing that challenge because they are, they've already been paid for. They are essentially enormous batteries on wheels, much bigger than a, I mean, even a relatively small electric vehicle probably has a battery three times the size of the Tesla Powerwall, which is already at least twice the size of its kind of near, next nearest home energy storage device competitor. So electric vehicles do represent a great opportunity to offer these services. And there's been quite a lot of modeling around the kind of the, the, the economic value we're talking about here. There was a report out today from Carbon Trust, which projected that flexibility could be worth 17 billion pounds per year to the UK economy um, in the future. Our own studies suggest that from domestic flexibility, you can, you can save about seven billion pounds per year. So there's really a significant amount of money. That's about, in our study, that's 200 plus pounds per customer per year. So that is a bit of a background, quickly moving on to Project Skiris itself, which is the world's largest domestic vehicle to grid program. Um, something we started in 2018, and we have built everything from scratch, um, including the hardware, the charging hardware, the platform, the installation capabilities, and the customer proposition. Um, just a few kind of high level facts. It was funded by Olev and Bayes via Innovate UK, uh, part funded. We had to, obviously, it wasn't entirely funded, unfortunately. Project partners there on the left. And essentially, we have installed almost just over 300 vehicle grid charges in customers' homes around the UK. We offered them, these customers, we offered a, a, a proposition. So essentially, we paid customers to export energy back to the grid. So at peak times, or actually any time, measured through their smart meter, we offered them a credit for the amount of energy they'd exported. We gave all of our customers and grid, uh, participants a free vehicle to grid charger, which is actually the first domestic vehicle to grid device ever made. And as um, Greg helpfully pointed out, much, much smaller than uh, what had come before. And we built a platform which managed this. We also gave the customer, so here we also gave the customer an app, which allowed them to, all of our customers can, can set how much energy um, they want their, their, essentially when they want their car to be full by and how full they want it to be. And that then allows our algorithms to trade around the battery capacity from the car. Excuse me, just close this window. So what did that look like on a customer's bill? You can see here, here's, a, here's an example bill. Uh, we paid a customer 33 and a half, just over 33 and a half pence for exports. This appeared as a credit on their bill. So in this customer's case back in 2019, they, their whole energy bill, including their gas bill was, was, was actually paid for. Well, say they had to pay 79p, it's thanks to their vehicle to grid contributions to, to the energy system. So, um, by the way, I'm very happy to take questions by email after this. I'm sorry I can't join your breakouts afterwards, but if anyone has any questions, do feel free to get my email address from, from the team. Um, this is just a quick thing might be interesting just to show you, and Oriane, let me know how much time I've got left if I'm really running close to being over time. This is a, 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 a kind of an example 24 hour period of how the charger works. So I don't know, can you see my cursor? Oh yes, we can. Okay, great. So if you see here, basically, the, 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 the person in this came back, plugged their car in it just after six o'clock. And you can see here, this light blue line shows 
how full the battery is in their car. So they plug the car in, the, you can see that the, the, the battery is at 80 plus percent state of charge. That's peak time, so we're looking to export to the grid at this point. So what happens is the charger starts exporting and you can see here it's exporting at around three and a half kilowatts. As it exports, the state of charge of the battery reduces until it reaches a point where you can see its state of charge is, is at 30%. So the customers obviously said, I don't want my, charge, my battery to be less than 30% full ever, regardless. Or possibly just stop charging because the, the, the price algorithm said it didn't need to anymore. The, uh, the brain then waits. We have a, a, the platform is called Kalusa. It waits until the middle of the night until the energy is at its cheapest and it starts charging the car. It takes the car back up to 100% charged. You can see here it's 100% charged and then it stops charging the car in time for the customer's ready time. They've said, the customer said they want it to be ready by 7 a.m. pretty much. It's fully charged by 7 a.m. Customer wakes up, has their breakfast, unplugs the car and drives wherever they're going probably to work. So that's the kind of 24 hours in the life of V2G charger. Very welcome again to see this slide if you'd like to look at that in a bit more detail. Just a few key data points that are worth sharing. Um, you know, you can make money out of this. Our tariff was quite generous. We found that we had to improve it through the course of the trial because the customers was, who were signing up wanted, you know, they could make, <laughs> ironically, because energy, the energy system in the UK has its own peculiar characteristics, even though we were trying to, we were offering to pay customers 300 pounds a year they could still actually have cheaper electricity bills elsewhere from shopping around. So that was a, an interesting challenge and speaks to the fact this does not exist in a vacuum. Um, moving on, just a couple of things. Greg talked about how much more engaged V2G was than typical smart charger customers. Sorry about those notifications. Just get them out of the way. Um, but you can see here that almost all of our customers, 75% of our customers plugged in their car after every trip. By comparison with smart charging data, that is, um, smart charging data is probably people charge twice a week on average. So that's a big increase. Okay, um, so this was, I thought, a really interesting uh, statistic. So at the beginning of the trial, 61% of participants expressed a concern about battery health. At the end of the trial, um, that had dropped to 24%. In other words, what they'd seen through their own experience of what impact that, that, uh, that this was having on their battery is that was enough to give them comfort, massive reduction in concerns. And that's, uh, by the way, supported by the fact that Nissan, uh, it, you know, warrants the battery for, for as long as the vehicle has been used within warranty conditions. Similarly, concerns about how much money could be saved, quite a few customers were concerned about that, and by the end of the trial, they were not. So successful in some of the key areas that customers were concerned about from before and after. The other really interesting point, I thought, and so very powerful in terms of the future of vehicle to grid, is just how many of these participants, and this was a trial, it was full of challenges, difficulties and hiccups. Still 93% of participants are satisfied with their charger and obviously a, a, a proportion of that were very satisfied. So V2G really works, customers are ready for it. Um, technologically it works. There are some market conditions that need to improve in order for, 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 um, for the kind of mass rollout but it works very well. And, um, and as, we, as we develop, we can expect some great things. I just say one more thing to Greg's point about the cost of chargers. The one thing he didn't mention, which is actually really where this will be revolutionized, I believe, is he didn't mention that what we, start, what we will see is automotive OEMs putting the inverter, which is the most important component of, expensive component rather, of a vehicle grid charger, putting the inverter within the vehicle. At this point, it becomes mass produced, much lower cost, and you can use an AC charger, a traditional domestic charger to provide vehicle to grid uh, services with. And then we're talking about really, really fast paybacks. Um, and you can just imagine every vehicle will be vehicle to grid capable. It's worth noting that the Honda E and also the Ionic, the new Hyundai Ionic 5 are both vehicle to grid enabled, not fully in the sense you could power your whole home from it, but. Um, but an impressive step forward, and I think we can expect that to continue. Thank you for listening. And if we can now go to uh, Albina from, um, who's the parlor, who is the parlor um, manager? Over to you. Everyone. 
Thank you very much for having me. Let me just try and share my slides quickly. Mm. Hopefully you can all see that now. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Yeah. Brilliant. Great. Well, what a what a brilliant range of speakers we have had so far. Um, my name is Albena. I am the Power Loop Project Manager and I manage the project across Octopus Electric Vehicles and Octopus Energy. And would like to talk to you today about a bit about the project, where we are, and um, some of our main findings, which <clears throat> Evie has already alluded to because a lot of our kind of findings and work are related to um, how vehicle to grid fits with uh, the DNO. But I will, I will tell you kind of our project perspective as well. So for those of you who might not be familiar with PowerLoop, um, PowerLoop is our innovation project with uh, Octopus Energy and Octopus Electric Vehicles. And its target is to bring vehicle to grid into domestic properties, focusing on the UK power networks uh, region. And the reason why we decided to kind of focus on that region specifically is because firstly, UKPN is one of our consortium partners. But secondly, we wanted to have a kind of more limited geographic range in order to be able to um, focus our project. And that's kind of where our engineering capability was at the time as well, which um, has now changed and we've expanded a bit further, but that's kind of the reasons why um, we have kept to UK Power Networks as a region. What PowerLoop aims to do is to basically provide an end-to-end -end package to domestic customers and give them both the technology and the incentives that they need in order to participate in vehicle to grid. So what we do across the project reflects our roles as um, market players. So as Octopus Electric Vehicles, we are an electric vehicles leasing company. So in the context of PowerLoop, we lease electric vehicles to domestic customers, focusing on the Nissan Leaf, which is one of the few vehicles available on the market today that are um, B2G enabled. From Octopus Energy side, we take care of um, the tariff and also provide a dedicated app that uh, enables customers to control charging and, and gives them the flexibility to decide what levels of charge they want to achieve um, by the next morning. And in addition to that, with our sister company, Octopus Energy Services, we take care of the installation end-to-end. -end. So we do all of the um, electric upgrades that can be done in the home. So things like uh, upgrading the tails in order for UKPN to upgrade the fuse, making sure that all of our customers have SMETs to smart meters installed, and then finally also installing um, the charger with the customer. So this is kind of the, the tech bundle, if you like, and what, um, what customers get. And the way that it is structured and the way that it works in terms of incentives is um, in very basic terms, we try to incentivize people to make their vehicle available. In other words, plug in during certain times when we think um, it is valuable to the grid. The constraints that we have put on the trial are to plug in at least before 6 p.m. and keep the plug vehicle plugged in until at least 5 a.m. The thinking around those times um, 6 p.m. being a time that most people in non-COVID days anyway would uh, arrive home and 5 a.m. being a time by which we would have enough hours during the night window to recharge the vehicle back to whatever level the customer has requested um, after them having done a vehicle to grid cycle between 4 and 7 p.m., which we consider to be the system peak. And the way that the trial is designed at the moment is if the customer makes their car available in this manner at least 12 times a month, um, we reward them with a 30 pound cashback. Now, where are we with the trial today? So um, I'm very pleased to say that we have filled our cohort um, officially as of uh, early May, 2021. So our cohort was limited to 135 domestic customers within UKPN. And um, those are now all acquired customers. On the map that you can see on the slide, in blue is where uh, kind of where the customer coverage is today. And the uh, purple dots are where we have installed chargers. So hopefully very soon within the next two, three months, 
um, the entire map will be shining purple. And um, in terms of delivery numbers, we've delivered 82 chargers, uh, installed 82 chargers. Actually, it's 85 uh, today. We installed three, three chargers today, and we have delivered 89 vehicles. The reason why there is a slight discrepancy between the number of um, chargers installed and the number of vehicles uh, delivered is because of the need for export limiting devices, which um, I will talk a bit more today. But in short, some of our um, customers, mainly those who have solar, um, in terms of the G99 that Evie already talked about, uh, the full seven kilowatt export couldn't be accepted by the grid. And so what we have done is we have invested into um, research and development for G100 devices, which is another engineering recommendation. And the way the devices work is we monitor the aggregate export from the property at all times. And if it starts to reach the limit set by UKPN that is acceptable um, for export, we selectively switch the solar off for however long uh, we need to in order to allow the vehicle to grid to export. And then everything comes back on um, once the vehicle to grid has stopped or uh, one, once it's basically allowed. But in terms of uh, project perception, we didn't want customers that already have renewable generation, again, mainly solar, to miss out on a vehicle to grid just because the full export could not be, could not be accepted. So it's kind of a way of, I think, as a project, um, looking at the wider scenarios and, and trying to include people who are already a bit further on the journey of, uh, of decarbonization. Uh, a bit more about the project and, and how it is structured. Uh, Powerloop is an Innovate UK project, which is part funded by the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy um, base and the Office for uh, now renamed to Zero Emission Vehicles, previously OLEV, now called OZEV. And we work in a consortium of uh, six partners. So I have already talked about um, Octopus Energy and our role, Octopus Electric Vehicles. Uh, EVs has, has kind of given you the view of uh, UK Power Networks. So they are our distribution network operator partner. And in addition to that, we have two partners. Um, one is Open Energy, who are our aggregation partner. And the work that we are doing with them um, is also involved in TransPower that Evie has already mentioned, but we are trying to take a view from a supplier and aggregator point of view and say, what can we do with those 135 exporting uh, zero carbon assets on the grid? And how can we um, monetize uh, these batteries? And lastly, uh, we work with the Energy Savings Trust who are helping us understand the consumer perception. So there is a range of surveys that is going out to customers um, at the beginning, throughout, and at the end of the project to understand how do they perceive the technology? What is their interaction with the charger? What is their interaction with the car? Um, so we're kind of trying to go into the property and say, what is it like to live with a vehicle to grid charger and a vehicle to grid um, enabled car? So hopefully some very exciting findings um, will be will be apparent soon from uh, from those surveys, as well as from our work on TransPower with UKPN and with Open Energy, now that we have those assets on the ground and are working on monetizing them. Um, lastly, and again, Evie has touched a little bit on that already, but uh, when we think about what are the main kind of findings or contributions that um, we have done through Powerloop, uh, a lot of them, a lot of them talk about um, the interaction of those assets with the grid. So, one of the outcomes has been Smart Connect. So, Evie has already mentioned that system, but throughout the customer interactions that we have had, and it has actually been with much more than 135 customers because naturally people change their minds. Sometimes they go out. Sometimes we can't accept them. We have had a lot of customer feedback, and um, I think it's part of the largest benefits of this consortium project, being able to share that customer feedback, share our feedback as a different kind of provider with UKPN. And um, this feedback has, has contributed to um, Smart Connect and the structure and, and requirements for the G99. 
And secondly, we have uh, worked very hard to streamline the G99 journey as much as possible. So you can see here a snippet um, of the journey that we present our customers with. So we are working with a company called Enroute and have designed a very interactive um, journey that can be done on the mobile, which then helps us gather all of the information in terms of information, pictures, um, mainly photos of fuses uh, and other very exciting stuff that then helps us take the process over from our end and um, work with UKPN on the G99s. Um, on the kind of network challenges and, and next steps that we have been able to identify throughout the project, one of them has, has been um, the availability and granularity of data on the low voltage network. So I think both from our side and UKPN side, it, it is becoming apparent that if the eco grid is to become very streamlined, investment into the low voltage um, data and knowledge of the, of the network is very important. And that is already being done through uh, projects that EV is working on. And secondly, as I already mentioned, you can see this G100 export limiting device on the bottom, um, including properties that are already installing solar or have other low carbon um, technologies on the ground is very important. So being flexible and, and um, understanding the system need and understanding how all of those devices can be combined together rather than just saying, we can't accept the whole export so you're not eligible is, uh, is, is really, really important. And lastly, as part of TransPower, being able to engage consumers even more. So sending them signals to tell them the story about what the grid needs, which we are going to try to do uh, through TransPower and seeing how they react to real life and, and real time signals from the grid uh, is going to be kind of one of our biggest challenges in the next months. And um, one of the things that I personally am very, very excited about and, and would love to see uh, how ready consumers are to, to interact with the grid. So that's, that's all I have today on PowerLoop specifically. Um, but if you have any, any questions or any concerns, you can uh, visit the website to learn a bit more. And I will be in, the, in one of the breakout rooms as well for, for further assistance.